who's the um, person who also works with me on programs. Um, this, it was her um, inspiration and, and idea to contact um, Dr. Bogan and to arrange for him to speak to us tonight. So thank you, Gay. Um, the title of the, our program tonight is Rebirth of the Santa Cruz, the Rapid Return of Aquatic and Riparian Species to Downtown Tucson. And our presenter, Dr. Michael Bogan, is a freshwater ecologist and an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Arizona. He studies the impact of natural disturbances, such as droughts and floods, and anthropogenic or human effects um, on water use on aquatic species and biodiversity in streams and springs. And he studies um, in the Southwest um, and also Northwestern Mexico. He's been working in the region as an ecologist since 2000. He earned his master's and doctoral degrees at Oregon State University, and then worked um, as a postdoc researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, and has been um, at the university since 2016. So he's going to be sharing with us um, the return of dragonflies and other aquatic species to the Santa Cruz River in downtown Tucson. Historically, the river had a year-round flow downtown. However, diversions and groundwater pumping dried up the river in the early 20th century. And since that time, the river only flows during periods of heavy precipitation. But then, and this was very exciting, I think, to those of us who have been here for a while, in June of 2019, Tucson Water restored perennial flow to the river by releasing um, treated effluent into it. And so since that time, Dr. Boken and his collaborators have been documenting the return of many aquatic species to the river. Um, but they've also been noting, as have some of us, the return of invasive plants, buffalo grass, Bermuda grass, Johnson grass. And so um, Dr. Bogan's team is working to identify the potential for restoring native plant species with the hopes of returning um, some of the characteristics of the historic native habitat to the river. So we're very excited to hear about the Santa Cruz, the return of um, aquatic and riparian species, and think about maybe how ANPS can be involved in combating also the return of the bad plants. Thank you, Dr. Bogan. And can I just interrupt before you start, Michael? Um, would you please, if you're in, in the audience, would you please mute yourself for the duration of the presentation so we don't hear the TV or your dog, or in my case, my cat in the background. And if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat and we will compile those questions and ask them after the talk. Thank you very much and enjoy the talk. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Lynn and Susan. Um, and I will, I'm, I'm fairly used to teaching online, so I'll also keep an eye on the chat. And if the question seems good, I'll, I'll answer it right as we're going along as well. Um, so thanks very much for the, for the invitation to speak. I'm excited to see a lot of uh, friends in the audience tonight, some familiar faces. It's good to see Ken Kingsley and Gavin Campbell all the way from Jamaica and uh, several other friends. Um, so thanks to everyone for, for being here tonight. Um, I want to give a couple disclaimers. Uh, the first is that I'm not a botanist or a plant ecologist. <laughs> so I will, I will, as we, as uh, Susan talked about, I will mention some opportunities for plants and what I've learned from the book that we were talking about before the, the, um, the meeting started. Um, but I'm not a plant ecologist, so I might not have the best answers to your questions about those. Um, I'm a longtime plant fan. I studied a, a timberline tree species, the bristlecone pine, for my undergraduate thesis. Um, so I'm, I've, I've been a fan of plants. But anyway, um, and then the second is that um, I'm a little 
ambitious in what I'm including tonight. So I have a lot of slides, but the good news is they're mostly photos. Um, and we are gonna start with a good chunk of the past in order to um, kind of put into context this rapid return of species that we're seeing downtown. Um, as I think Carl Sagan said, you have to study the past to understand the present. Um, so we're gonna do that in this talk as well. And get started here. Hopefully folks can see the second slide, a map, thumbs up. Yeah, all right, so for um, folks who are not in Tucson or maybe not as familiar, I just wanted to give you a, a, a satellite eye view of the Santa Cruz River. Uh, it actually is a, a tri-national river, so it starts in the US here, flows south into Mexico, and then does a 180, turns back north, uh, flows through the Santa Verde district of the Tanapa Nation, um, and then passes through Tucson, and uh, eventually, theoretically, that water makes it to the Gila River and then down the Gila River to the Colorado. Um, but as we know, the, those rivers are much drier than they used to be. Um, even historically, the Santa Cruz was not a consistently perennial river. So on in the inset map you can see here, there were long stretches that were um, dry for seasons or for most of the year. Um, so the perennial stretches of the river uh, in the headwaters in Sonora, near Nogales, um, and then two here locally were, were really important for, um, for uh, species and for people. Um, so here locally, the two perennial reaches, historically perennial reaches of the river uh, were at what's now the Santa Verde District of the Tanawatan Nation, um, or what's known as WAC, which is where the river goes into the ground, and then uh, Chuxon or Tucson, um, both of these were, were Autumn villages and um, Wak is still part of the Tano Autumn Nation today. So that's why I think it's important to start out with that acknowledgement um, that everything that I'm talking about tonight, these places, and if you're in Tucson, everywhere you live in the city um, is the ancestral homeland of these um, Autumn folks, the Sabaipuri or the Wak Autumn um, who lived on the river and the Tonalatum who live in the desert all around, um, including in the Tucson Basin. Um, so it's been their homeland and that of their ancestors, the Hugum, since time immemorial. Um, they were, and in the case of Santa Navir, continue to be excellent stewards of the river and its biodiversity. Um, this is a little bit of a hint of what the river used to look like in downtown Tucson. Um, this is a, a an image from the one of the books that we mentioned in the email blast, the Requiem for the Santa Cruz, a great book by Bob Webb and, and others. Um, and um, you can see this is taken from St. Mary's Road in 1927. So if you drive across St. Mary's Road on the Santa Cruz today, it obviously looks a lot different than that. Um, so it's, it's been through quite a lot of changes uh, since it was stewarded by the Autumn um, just only 150 years ago. This is roughly that same location today. Um, so this is the star of our show today, the Santa Cruz River in downtown Tucson. To orient you, this is a mountain over here. Uh, the river is flowing north alongside uh, Interstate 10 and here's Congress, um, the Congress Bridge and the Cushing Street Bridge here. Um, so it obviously looks a lot different than it used to, um, but this is, this is kind of the, the landscape that we're working within today. What I think it's, it's really important to do, um, both as an ecologist and as a resident of Tucson, is to peel back those layers and realize what you're walking on and what history you're stepping on when you're in these different places. So if you were to imagine yourself um, sitting here at the... Um, Mercado San Augustine, maybe you're having tacos at Sace Kitchen um, or getting a, a coffee there. Um, what you're actually standing on top of is at least 4,000 years of history. Um, so this is a, a wonderful map from a, an archeology span report um, back in 2006. And this is that exact location where Mercado San Augustine is now um, but you'll notice here when they did the archeology span work there, they realized that that is a 4,000 year old farming settlement there. And all of that relied on the Santa Cruz River. So these blue lines are irrigation canals that came off the Santa Cruz River. Um, and basically everywhere in this area of downtown Tucson, um, the area we're talking about tonight, there's just layers and layers of this history. So that's 4,000 years old uh, right here where there's now a, um, I think it's like a retirement community high-rise tower 
um, that was a village uh, from 3,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago and it had irrigation canals associated with it. Mission Gardens, which a lot of you probably know about, um, was originally a Hohokam irrigation site and then an Autumn uh, irrigation site and then later on um, Spanish missionaries and then after that uh, Chinese immigrants in the 1880s. All of it is connected to the river. Um, so the, the history downtown is so incredibly rich and the, the culture there um, has, has so much importance. So what I do as an ecologist is try to understand what that ecosystem was like um, that, that so many people relied upon um, and that our um, indigenous uh, folks stewarded for so many years. Um, unfortunately, because as Susan mentioned, it dried up about a hundred years ago, the historical ecology record isn't all that strong, um, but we do have some information and it's kind of fallen down a rabbit hole the last oh, four or five months trying to dig up every piece of historical ecology I can on the river. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a visitor who passed through Tucson in 1854, and he described the river as being a rapid brook, clear as crystal, full of aquatic plants, fish, and turtles of various kinds, flowing through a small meadow covered with shrubs. Um, and you could see that even in 1927 when this photo was taken, um, where we have uh, riparian flora of cottonwood, ash, and willow trees, um, arrowweed, seep willow as an understory, all kinds of aquatic plants, sedges, cattails. Um, so it was, it was a, a pretty lush spot in an otherwise uh, dry desert. This is from the book that we've been uh, mentioning the last, at the beginning of the meeting, and that We'll put uh, details into the chat and it's called An Agreeable Landscape. Fantastic effort that Catherine Moss did here, basically spending a long time in a bunch of herbaria around the country, including here in Tucson, trying to find every historic plant record from the Santa Cruz and from uh, the Rito here in Tucson. Um, and so from her work, we're able to pull this list of what some of those wetland plants were downtown um, so there's about 36 species of obligate wetland plants that were known from the river downtown. Um, I'll let folks who love the Latin names kind of look through there and see if they can find their favorite one. Um, normally, I don't like to put this much text on a screen, but it gives you an idea of how, how lush it was. One I will call your attention to is this one that's drawn here and underlined over here, and that is the Huachuca water umbel. Uh, which is an endangered species today, uh, known just from a few locations, um, but actually the one of the original specimens when the species was described scientifically came from downtown Tucson right at um, Congress Street. So it's, it's uh, just showing kind of how lush that original ecosystem was in the river downtown. And we'll come back to this table um, when we talk about the modern day. Um, since I'm a more of a, a, an animal kind of ecologist, I'm focused on reconstructing those histories as well. Um, these are the six native fish species that we had in the river downtown historically. Um, so you may have heard of some of them like the Gila top minnow um, or the Gila chub. Those are still present over in a place like Sabino Canyon. Um, but we actually had a, a pretty diverse ecosystem um, down there as far as fishes go. Um, some of these were abundant enough to um, support kind of small scale fisheries. There's great newspaper articles from 1871 talking about people catching strings of Gila chub from the river to bring home and eat. Um, so a, a pretty neat, pretty neat ecosystem. Let's see here. Uh, really rich amphibian fauna as well downtown. Um, so these are the, the um, see four or seven species of frogs and toads that we knew were downtown when the river was still flowing year round. Um, some of them really cool tropical species like the narrow mouth toad. Um, some of them you probably recognize maybe from even from your yards still in Tucson, they persist things like the Sonoran desert toad um, and the couches spade foot that we can still find in town. Others that have become a lot more rare these days like the lowland leopard frog. Um, but again, if you look at historical newspaper articles, 1870s, 1880s, uh, they talk about knowing that spring is here because you can hear the melodious warble of the frogs in the river downtown. 
Um, so that's what you would have heard historically uh, in downtown Tucson is lowland leopard frogs uh, clucking and warbling their way through the spring when they're in their breeding season. Um, just a few other species that we know historically downtown, garter snakes, lots of birds, um, so, uh, mud turtles, the Sonora mud turtle here. One that I was totally blown away by when I first learned was the California floater mussel. This is a large freshwater mussel about this big. Um, and it was abundant enough in the Santa Cruz River downtown that not only did the Hohokam and Otum people harvest it from the river, uh, but when Chinese immigrants arrived, they realized it was a good food resource. And so there's middens or trash piles um, that have been excavated out of downtown Tucson associated with Chinese immigrants harvesting the mussel out of the river to cook and eat. Um, so a, a very different system from what um, we may have thought um, the, the Santa Cruz could support, especially before 2019, before we saw water back into it. Um, all of that unfortunately ended, all of that lush biodiversity and aquatic ecology ended with water withdrawals as the city of Tucson grew. Um, I'm going to tie in a couple of questions I see in the chat here. One is, do we know how deep the river was in non-flood times before it dried up? Um, and I'm pulling together all the accounts and it seems like the deepest parts of the river downtown were probably about four feet deep. So not real deep, but um, deeper than you might expect given the Sandy Channel today. Um, and then there's a question about why the river was perennial downtown and not other places. Um, and that's primarily because of the geology. And so downtown Tucson, A Mountain is basically an old lava flow. And so underground, A Mountain continues that lava flow and it forces groundwater up to the surface. And so that's why it was one of the perennial reaches downtown. Um, but because all that water was close to the surface, it also meant it was pretty easy to tap into. And so at first it was just diversion canals, just like we'd seen on the river for thousands of years. But then we came along with a thing called a, a diesel pump and we realized we could pump well water from along the banks of the river. Um, and then in 1913, they put in what's called the cross cut canal, which was a huge canal all the way across the, the uh, river channel and multiple pumps and multiple wells. And there was a track and it was put in a canal and delivered to what's now the town of Flowing Wells or the neighborhood of Flowing Wells. So when you hear about Flowing Wells, there weren't any wells in the area of Flowing Wells. It was water that was taken from the river downtown and put in a canal all the way out to Flowing Wells. So when we lost even the seasonal flow, the winter flows or the monsoon flows, then that's when that riparian forest disappeared as well. The cottonwoods died off, the willows died off, um, and we were left with not much else. So we not only lost water, but then we also built a city here, right? It was easier to build the city here once that water was gone. We could develop a lot of the floodplain. Um, but the river, even in its dry state, is still pretty prone to flooding. It's a, it's a standard desert river. Um, and so that historic Santa Cruz River could be up to a half mile wide when it was in full flood stage. Um, and there's a great quote from the Bob Webb book here that says the behavior of the Santa Cruz River is not as predictable as might be preferred for a floodway that runs through a major metropolitan area, right? So we don't, when a river goes from six feet wide to 2,400 feet wide in a short period of time, that makes it pretty hard to live next to if we wanna develop that prime real estate. So that is basically what led us to where we're at today and this small canal that uh, is the current Santa Cruz River. So there's that historic floodplain, 2,400 feet wide. We would see Menlo Park underwater. We would see Barrio Santa Cruz, Barrio Hollywood, and even some of downtown Tucson underwater. Um, so what we did is basically dig out a deeper and narrower version of the Santa Cruz River to get water through as fast as possible. So the, the transformation that we've seen and that we're thinking about in this ecological context is from here looking south to A Mountain in 1925, one of the last big floods before the uh, river channel was, was heavily modified. And then a similar view today in 2018. Um, and so you'll notice not only is that riparian forest gone, all those uh, cottonwoods and willows are gone, replaced by mesquites, uh, but we've got these soil cement banks. And those went in in the 80s and 90s, and we excavated the river channel out so that 
as much water as, po as possible can move through downtown in as small a space as possible. But then, magically, thanks to the magic of Tucson water, uh, we started seeing water in that channel last year, as Susan mentioned, in, in summer of 2019. And that is treated effluent or treated wastewater um, flowing through that channel. This is all thanks to the vision of Tucson Water um, and the Tucson Water Director, Tim Tomier, who's, uh, this has been his, his passion for a while to get this project going. And they did it in a remarkably short amount of time um, on a remarkably good budget. And so this is the, the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project. Um, we have effluent flowing in different parts of the Santa Cruz River today, but this is a little bit different in that it's using effluent to restore flow to one of the historically perennial reaches. If you go out to Sweetwater or out to Marana, the river's flowing there from effluent, but historically those were actually the dry reaches and the perennial reach was downtown. So that makes this project, I think, more of a um, more of a culturally relevant or culturally interesting thing to think about. And that's why I think they gave it the name, the Heritage Project. So the idea is to put water here effluent into the river just south of Star Pass or 22nd Street, and then it flows north. And their original goal of the project is just to have it at least get as far as Congress Street. Um, and through time, it's actually sometimes made it further than that and sometimes retracted a little bit, but that's, that's the scale of the original project. Uh, it's this really high quality wastewater, tertiary treated wastewater, and they discharge between about 800 and 1900 gallons per minute into the river. The primary purpose was aquifer recharge, um, but as we'll see in a little bit, there's a lot of other benefits that came along with that aquifer recharge. One kind of semantics thing though that I, I always like to point out is, is what we mean when we use the word restore. Um, so in this situation, we are restoring flow to the Santa Cruz River, or I should say Tucson water is restoring flow to the Santa Cruz River. Um, but I don't use the words restoring the river or restoring the ecosystem, right? Because that historic ecosystem would be a floodplain a half mile wide. And we don't have that anymore. And we're not going to get back to that um, without some radical re- um, renovation of our downtown corridor and a lot of people having to leave their homes. Um, so we're kind of creating a new thing, which is why I call it the rebirth of the Santa Cruz, right? This is not the historic Santa Cruz, um, the perennial system that was here, but it's also not uh, a dry channel. It's somewhere in between these two things. Um, and it makes it really interesting to study. So here's that first day, June 24th, 2019. Um, it was a very Tucson event. It was 105 degrees, hottest day of that year so far. And yet we still had hundreds. I think the final count was something around the neighborhood of 550 people came down to see the, the event and the water get released. Um, we had uh, Chairman, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking out on his name right now, which is terrible, but the chairman of the, the Santa Vera district of the Tano Atom Nation, Austin Nunez, uh, was there. We had mariachi because we're in Tucson and you got to have mariachi here in Tucson. Um, and we had a lot of people turn out. So it was just, just a really fun event. I bet Tucson Water was a little nervous with how many people were actually playing in the water, but it is safe for contact. <laughs> you just don't want to put your head underwater necessarily. Um, but it was a great community event. Great to see everyone excited to see water back in the river for the first time in probably 116 years at that point in time. While everybody else was focused on splashing around though, what caught my eye immediately was some of the aquatic species that had already found that river. At this point in time, when this photo was taken, um, the river had been flowing about three and a half hours. And yet already some dragonflies and some damselflies figured out that there was some water there. And not only did they come in and perch on the plants above that water, but they also started mating and they started laying their eggs in that water within a few hours of flow coming back. So this, this really blew my mind. I knew that they were good at flying. I knew they'd find a new habitat pretty quickly, um, but not at that scale. I, I just did not expect that. Um, so we had no plans to study 
the Heritage Project, but as soon as I saw that, I said, okay, I got to figure out how to study this. We're going to do it. <laughs> we're, even if we don't have any funding, we're going to figure it out because uh, this is too cool to pass up. Um, and so I started going back immediately and doing a, a basically a dragonfly study because they're fun and easy and beautiful. Um, you can go down there and do visual surveys like you would do for bird surveys or plant surveys um, and started keeping track of dragonflies as they were showing up along the river. Um, there's a question, where was Tucson water discharging their wastewater prior to the Heritage Project? It was actually going into the ground at Sweetwater Wetlands. Um, and what happened there is they reached their limit of what they were able to recharge, um, what the state allows them to recharge at uh, Sweetwater Wetlands. So they were trying to find new places to recharge the aquifer. Um, and this is one of those new places. So what we're gonna see here is basically how the dragonfly has showed up through time. So I went back every couple of weeks or so, checking it out, doing surveys, seeing if new dragonflies were showing up. Um, so the, the scale for time will be down at the bottom. You'll see different dates pop up and then we'll see which species showed up on those dates. So June 24th, first day, only hours after flows started, seven species had already found this new flowing reach and many of them were already mating and laying eggs, getting a generation established in that river. I went back just four days later and found another six species. So now we're up to 13 in the first week of flow. Uh, another week or two later, found another three or four species of, of dragonflies and damselflies. Then we hit August 3rd, another four species. Now we hit the first hiccup and we'll talk about this towards the end too, where occasionally there's an issue with the pipe or with the infrastructure and the water gets turned off. We hit one of those hiccups early on in the project. There was no flow for uh, three weeks while Tucson Water fixed the pipes and fixed the infrastructure. So during that period, it wasn't very attractive to uh, aquatic organisms because there's only a tiny puddle of water left, uh, but we still managed to pick up one more new species during that time. Then the water gets turned back on and they start coming back again like crazy. So we've got another five or six species, more again late September, more again in October. And then October 25th, we're up to 41 species of dragonflies and damselflies in a river that had only existed for the previous five months. Um, so that, that really kind of blew me away. Then we get into the winter. Dragonflies don't really like winter all that much, even Tucson winter. So we stopped picking up new species and then we got our 42nd and final new species on January uh, 19th. So that's a lot of species of dragonflies and damselflies, 42. And just to give you a little context, that's 80% of all the species we know from anywhere else on the Santa Cruz River, any of those other reaches with water. And that's over 30% of the species known from the entire state of Arizona. So 30% of the species of the entire state showed up at the Heritage Project in the first year that it was flowing. So from a dragonfly perspective, that's an enormous biodiversity success right there. Of course, we couldn't just keep our eyes on the dragonflies. There's a lot of stuff going on downtown and a lot of stuff going on in the river. So here are some of our other observations, other animals we've been studying. Uh, Sonoran desert toads were really quick to find the river. They were there within a few days. Um, this is a mated pair and then there's big strings of eggs um, that you can see behind them there. Um, so they were one of the historic species that returned very quickly, probably because they can breed in ponds and other parts of Tucson. So they're already around the area and just rapidly came back as soon as the water came in. Uh, Great Plains toad was another one that came back quickly. Uh, here's a, a breeding male that was calling downtown uh, in the middle of summer. So another historic species back in the river downtown. The checkered garter snake. This one took a little longer. It took about four months before we saw this species come back, um, but eventually it slithered its way in either from maybe from Sweetwater wetlands or from uh, the probably in some of the golf course ponds in town. So it might have come from three or four or five miles away, but eventually it it found its way back to the river and they've actually established a good population down there now. Uh, the birds have really responded. Uh, the killdeer were probably one of the first water requiring birds that came back. Uh, they were back within a few days um, and they, 
uh, have been breeding downtown ever since. Their numbers are, are doing great down there. And we'll talk more about birds uh, towards the end. And then some of the other species needed a little bit of help to get back. Um, so fish can't really fly like a dragonfly. They can't slither in like a, like a snake, can't hop in like a toad. Um, and so we've given them a little bit of help. This is the, the Gila top minnows is the first of those original native species um, that we're putting back in the river. We brought these from um, uh, the river in Nogales where there's a good population. Um, and stocked them in the river downtown this past October. Um, and that was a, a good partnership with uh, Arizona Game and Fish and the county and US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and now that it's warming up again, they'll be back in their breeding colors. So you can go down there to Star Pass, uh, 22nd Street is a good spot to see them in the river and see their breeding antics, which is what's happening here. There's a male that's guarding this uh, female fish. Uh, the wetland plants, the diversity has not really come back that quickly. They haven't been as fast to move back in. Um, so the ones I have in bold here in black are the only ones on that original native species list that we've been able to find in the river downtown. Um, so only five or six of those original 35 or 36. Um, part of this is probably because a lot of these plants um, like to have groundwater near the surface, especially something like the Huachuca water rumble. Um, so they may or may not be happy with the new version of the Santa Cruz River that is just surface water only and um, effluent flowing at the surface. Um, other of these just might have populations that are a little too far away. So like the fish, we might need to bring and carry and plant some of these uh, native wetland species back into the river. Um, but some of them have done extremely well. And so I'll show you here an example of, uh, especially the cattails, the typha. So here's that first day of flow in June of 2019. February 2020, you can see the cattails have made their appearance here. And um, there's also some smartweed in here and some speedwell, uh, some duckweed popping up. Uh, but you'll see the cattails were thriving. They were loving that water. There they are in April of 2020. And then by the time we hit November, I pretty much couldn't take my repeat photo anymore <laughs> because the cattails had grown so tall. They're about 15 feet tall down there. Um, and it's been wonderful because now we have wetland birds that are associated with these cattails. Um, it's, it's really created a, a really neat ecosystem down there. So the diversity of wetland plants is not super high, but their, their abundances are getting uh, pretty nice. So for the last bit here, we'll talk about um, some of the challenges we've had of this new ecosystem. Um, one is the one I've already mentioned, and that's the fact that the flow is totally dependent on our pipes and totally dependent on, on Tucson water discharging water. Um, so here's an example from uh, last November, going down there, finding the river dry, calling them up and they said, oh yeah, well, we had, a, we had a little issue with this or that. And I said, oh, can you turn the water back on? They're like, oh yeah, in 10 minutes, we can turn it back on. You know, and there's the exact same scene a half hour later with the river flowing again. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a tricky place to live if there's uncertainty like that. The uncertainty was, was amplified in the first year of the Heritage Project um, because of an issue that Tucson Water had no control over, which is the fact that when the river dried up downtown and there was a dry open floodplain, the residents of Tucson at the time decided to dig sand and gravel out of the floodplain and use that sand and gravel for construction all over Tucson, right? Makes sense. But then the residents of Tucson decided that with those gravel pits, they should put their trash in it and use those gravel pits as landfills. And so we actually have 17 different landfills buried landfills along the river downtown, um, including some that are under people's houses, under businesses. And so what the concern is, is that if the groundwater levels get too high, it will actually hit the bottom of those landfills and potentially leach out whatever um, contaminants might be in those landfills. And because the landfills were occupied from the 40s to the 70s, it could be DDT, you know, we don't really know what could be in them. Um, so. Tucson water is not able to have as much water as they'd like in the river because it will bring the aquifer up too high and potentially bring it in contact with those landfills. So 
it took a while to figure out the dynamics of the releases and the aquifer goes up and then they'd have to turn the water down, get the aquifer to drop back down, turn the water up. And they finally kind of dialed in and about 800 gallons per minute seems to be the happy medium to keep the river flowing, um, but keep the, the water levels low enough that they don't hit those aquifers. And then of course, the other issue that we have to think about because this is an urban river is flood control and flooding. Right, so here's our modern day channel. Here's that historic floodplain width. So this channel has to do a lot of work. It has to carry a lot of water. And what happens over the years is that vegetation grows in, that vegetation traps sediment behind it, and then more vegetation grows on top of that sediment and sediment builds up in this artificial channel to the point that that channel can't hold the same flood that it used to. Um, and so what Pima County Flood Control District has to do in order to protect the neighborhoods along there is to make sure this channel has enough capacity for those huge floods. And this means that it occasionally has to come in and remove sediment out of the channel. And they did that this past year. The problem or the concern that we had when they scheduled their sediment removal for this past summer was that here's that nice patch of cattails. Our best wetland vegetation was right here where we're releasing water out of the river. Um, and, it had, and then they announced that they were going to you know, come in and remove that sediment. And so what we did is kind of work out a compromise with Pima County Flood Control District where this area had kind of become a wetland. Um, that's where most of those native wetland plants were concentrated. So we said, let's try to preserve some of that area so those wetland plants don't have to colonize all over again into a barren channel. And so we made a compromise, drew this little area out here and said, we'll redirect the channel, kind of get it out this way, turn this area into wetlands as well. And then once the sediments removed and the rivers turn back on, those wetland plants will be able to recolonize, you know, send their seeds down, send their their propagules down and recolonize what will become the Bear River Channel. So that's what you'll see here in the next couple slides. There's right after the sediment removal was done on June 1st of last year. So pretty grim looking, especially if you were like me and you'd walk that riverbed every day for a very long time. Um, there's five feet of sediment that was removed here along with all the plants. Um, and so we came in and created this little artificial wetland area adjacent to all those uh, wetland plants that went dormant when we turned the water off for, for several weeks while they did their construction equipment. And then we dug this channel here um, that we hoped would encourage those wetland plants to spread out into the riverbed. It worked pretty well, which is good news. So here's the photo from October of this past year. You could see those cattails just popped right back to life, the smart weed. Um, a lot of the, the wetland plants didn't mind that short dry period. Um, and then exactly as we had hoped, those wetland plants were spilling out down our constructed channel, spilling out into the riverbed and starting to fill in that bulldozed riverbed. Um, and here it is just a couple of weeks ago. And so we can see a lot more greenery that came in and it happened a lot faster um, than it did in the previous year. You could see a, a person on horseback here to give you a, a sense of scale. Um, this is just south of the, the Star Pass Bridge. Just to give you the insider view of that inside of the preservation area, we had excavated this uh, to fill as a little marshland, a little supplemental marsh, and then the channel again going out towards the Star Pass Bridge. So that's the first day we turned the water back on, June 1st. And then October 26th of this year, you can see over this past year, how quickly, I'll go back again, how quickly that wetland vegetation can grow when you give it a little bit of water and a lot of heat <laughs> and a little bit of time. And then by February 14th, it had basically completely filled in. Now this is saturated. So if you walk through here, there's a foot of water underneath you. Um, and it's a really nice habitat for a lot of birds, uh, a lot of insects and garter snakes, the toads. And just to give you one more view of the same thing. So here's the area we preserved in the Green Star. And this is looking uh, upstream uh, from the Star Pass Bridge, 22nd Street. You can see barren channels scraped all the way across with bulldozed. But then we can see here just as of uh, uh, a week or so ago that 
pres preservation area uh, worked well, all the wetland plants spilling out and recolonizing the riverbed. So mostly a success, but as, as Lynn and Susan both talked about, uh, there are some challenges that come along with that. Um, when the riverbed was scraped, we basically opened up a whole bunch of raw landscape for invasive species to move in. Um, so we are seeing a lot of salt cedar. There's two different species of tamarisk uh, that are tiny little sproutings are starting to pop up along here. Um, and then as they mentioned, Bermuda grass, buffalo grass, and Johnson grass are, are all spreading in here as well. Um, and this is, this is partly due to the water, but also partly due to that bulldozing and that disturbance. And you know, these species love that kind of disturbance um, area. So that is gonna be an ongoing challenge, uh, keeping up with, with these invasive species and trying to favor um, some of the native species. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a question in here, will the newly colonized wetland species be bulldozed as they gather sediment? The hope of Pima County Flood Control District is that the next time they'll have to do sediment removal is 30 years from now. So fingers crossed, we've got a long time before we have to worry about sediment removal again, and hopefully we can figure out a little bit better way to do it um, at that time period. And then the question of what is the green along the stream? That is perfect timing here. <laughs> So the green along the stream is a speedwell. It's a species of Veronica. And it's interesting because there was a native Veronica that's part of the, that um, historically perennial reach downtown, but this is not the native species of Veronica. It's kind of a cosmopolitan species that is, we're 99% sure is not native to Arizona, um, but it's probably native to parts of the East Coast and certainly native to um, Europe and Asia. So, it has gone, done very well. It is very happy here. It's grown in. It serves pretty good ecological purposes. Um, it's great. The butterflies and the bees love it. Uh, the aquatic insects love it. Um, it normally would not be at this crazy of a concentration because flow knocks it out. Um, so flow, things like um, floods and, and droughts, those kind of disturbances will knock back the speed well so it doesn't get quite as, as weedy looking as this. But as you all know, and as we talked about, it has been a dry year. So there has not been a single flood that has come down the Santa Cruz River to help kind of control the speed well and keep it at, at a lower level where it's serving a purpose, but not kind of hogging the whole riverbed. Um, so we're not quite sure. We're gonna kind of wait and see over the next couple of months. Hopefully we'll get a flood and the flood will kind of keep it in check. Um, but at some point, if this growth keeps happening and the spinach takes over the entire channel, we may think about um, about management of, of the speed well plant. So that kind of leads into the, the long-term idea. Um, this is, Tucson Water will call it, this is an experiment, right? We're releasing water into a place that has been dry for a hundred years and the channel is different than it used to be. Um, so this isn't a restoration project. We're not recreating the old Santa Cruz River. Um, it's experimental. We're still figuring out how it's working, what species are coming, if they're gonna like it there. Um, and I think one advantage to that is thinking of this as basically one big experimental community garden, right? So we know that there's problems. We know that there's these non-native species coming in. Um, we know that we can't have a bunch of trees down there um, because that would cause flood control issues. So we certainly can't have the, the salt cedar. Um, so I think, we need to move towards a mentality and thinking about the heritage project in this area as a garden that we all work in, that we all contribute a little bit to as we can um, so that these species don't get out of control um, so that we can maintain flood control concerns, um, but we're also supporting a lot of other species while we're doing it. Um, there's a, a gentleman named Angel, Uncle Antonio, who's doing a really neat project down at Cushing Street um, and he's basically kind of on his own come up with this idea of, of treating the river as a garden. Um, he just does a short stretching from uh, the Mission Lane to Cushing Street and uh, started going out there on his own on Sundays, just picking up trash and pulling some of the, the buffalo grass and non-native plants. Um, and people started joining him just kind of naturally and organically, people walking along the loop. Um, and now every Sunday, he's got a group of probably 10 or 15 people down there that are pulling buffalo grass, pulling salt cedar, 
um, putting down native uh, seeds that they get from the county, picking up trash. Um, so I'll, I'll send along his link um, in the chat a little bit later, but I think it's a, it's a great model for how we could think about everybody in the community being involved in the heritage project and having some, some positive ecological outcomes as we do it. Um, just to wrap up, and then I'll get to some of the questions that are in here. Um, I wanted to finish telling with uh, talking about what we're still continuing to do on the river. Um, so my group and grad students and undergrads at, at U of A are doing ongoing monitoring of dragonflies and damselflies. Um, we're actually collecting aquatic insects from the riverbed itself as well. Um, there's a lot more species than just dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, we're monitoring the fish, amphibians, reptiles, um, wetland plants, and then the water quality as well. Um, and both Sonoran Institute and the county will get involved in helping with the water quality stuff um, in this coming year, which is exciting. We're also expanding. Um, we have a, a generous donor who's supporting some of this new and ongoing research. Um, so we're expanding out into the the bird world, and we're really excited about that. Um, thanks to this donation, we're able to support um, an undergrad researcher and, and a master's student, Pablo Rocha. Um, so you'll see him down there every weekend uh, doing bird surveys along the river, and he'll be working in collaboration with Alia Phillips from Tucson Audubon. Uh, they already have a, kind of a community science um, program to start monitoring birds on the river. So we'll be working together with them, and I'm really excited about that. The cinnamon teal just showed up uh, uh, in breeding colors uh, the last couple of weeks. So you can go down to the river right now downtown and see them, they're, they're gorgeous. And then the newest project we've got going on is doing some wildlife cameras and monitoring. Uh, this is Ali Burnett, a grad student and Nikhil Nai, an undergrad at U of A. Um, and this is an image from just a couple of weeks ago of a, a pair of very healthy and happy coyotes walking along the river you can see the water in the background and the speed well in the background. Um, this is right by the Star Pass Bridge. And then I always like to invite and say that we need you too. We need everybody. <laughs> uh, right before we introduced the native Gila top minnow, somebody had, um, I think, without knowing the damage they might be doing, they, they introduced a, a non-native fish, the mosquito fish. That's common in a lot of people's backyard ponds. Um, so we, we race to put out these signs after that. We, we want to encourage people to be involved in the river, to help, but maybe not to introduce non-native plants and animals into the river. Um, so you'll see these signs up and down the river right now. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities for folks to get involved in the Heritage Project. And then the very last thing I promise, um, I have to put in a plug for the Santa Cruz River Research Days. Uh, this is an online conference that we have. Uh, coming up at the end of the month. So if you're interested in more Santa Cruz stuff, we'll be talking more dragonflies, birds, water quality, um, and, and a lot of the county people will talk about uh, and city people will talk about longer range plans for the river as well. Um, so I'll put that link in the chat um, as soon as I'm done here. So with that, I'll be happy to go back through, address some of the questions. Um, thank you all for listening. This is a, a huge project. There's a lot of moving parts. So there's a lot of folks to thank here uh, that you can see on this side. And then again, thanks to our, our generous donor who's, who's um, allowing this research to keep going. Because this was, you know, originally this was me riding my bike down there with my camera to take pictures of dragonflies. Um, and it has gotten much, much bigger than that. Um, so I'm glad that we have, have support to uh, keep it going. I will put a couple things in the chat right now and then uh, scroll back through the questions and I'm happy to answer questions too if folks want to unmute and, and ask a question. So Susie, are you there? Susie, I think you have to unmute. I heard her. Here I am. <laughs> it just took me a while to find that. Um, and, but thank you so much, um, Michael. That's just really fascinating. And I was looking at the chat also. Um, so 
Do you want to keep your screen up, Michael, or do you want to unshare? Uh, up to you. I can do either one. If folks have, have my contact info down, or I can put it in the chat too, then I can unshare and we can all see each other more easily. Um, I think it's possible we may need to re revisit it depending on questions, but let's leave it like that for now. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Well, one of the questions, is there any monitoring of the terrestrial insects and arachnids in and about the project area? I wish there was, but to my knowledge, there is not yet. Um, you know, anecdotally, we definitely, there's a lot of, it may surprise people, but there's a lot of spiders that specialize on eating aquatic insects. Um, when they first emerge out of the water, the spiders are waiting there by the river to, to eat them. Um, so we've seen a lot of spiders downtown, um, just a, a shocking number that are living along the water. So I'm, I'm certain it's having some impact on them and it's benefiting them. Um, and we definitely see, like I mentioned, there's a lot of um, pollinators on the speed well. Uh, we see um, uh, caterpillars, a lot of different types of caterpillars on the, the wetland plants as well. Um, so there's a lot going on for, for terrestrial insects, but, but uh, we, need, we need someone else to jump in and get involved in that. Well, maybe the person who asked that question would be interested in, in doing that. Yeah, I saw, I think that was Gavin. So he might have to come all the way out from, oh. from Jamaica, but we'd be happy to have him. <laughs> that would be great. Let's see, I see a question from Jack, it says what native plants are likely candidates for reintroduction, reintroduction to the modified Santa Cruz channel? That's a really good question. That's, I've been using the, the agreeable landscape book a lot to think about that. Um, at first there was the, basically there was just a tiny bit of money that Tucson Water had to support some native grass seeding um, and so there were, I couldn't tell you which species, um, but there were a handful of species that, that Tucson Water paid a consultant to um, seed downtown. And I think some of those have come up and some of them probably haven't, you know, in part due to our really dry year. Um, but they had a tiny bit of extra money. So they asked me what they should, if they could buy stuff and plant them, what they should do. And, and the number one thing I told them was arrowweed. Um, that's a, a really important plant to indigenous peoples um, and also a, a great plant for pollinators, a great plant for dragonflies to perch on. Um, and so they planted probably 16 or 18 arrowweed um, near the Star Pass Bridge and, and it's already started to flower and there's, I've already seen a few um, seedlings. So I think they must have done well last year or uh, I don't know what you call small shrubs saplings but anyway they're they seem like they're doing well and it's and it's uh not something that would cause pima county flood control to get nervous um, because it's not a, a huge woody tree so i think that would be good i think um we haven't planted any uh seep willow yet but i think that would be great the vaporous salicifolia and then there's a, a subset of the wetland obligates um some of the, the uh, rushes and sedges that I think they don't need groundwater, they just need saturation. Um, so there's probably six or eight of those I think would be really great candidates. Um, Mimulus monkey flower was down there before um, and it's on other parts of the river, but it hasn't showed up down there. So maybe we could seed some of those. There's, I think we could come up with a good list of, of wetland plants to, um, and riparian plants to encourage. It's just that the county and, you know, knowing flood control issues, you know, we're not, we're not going to have willows and cottonwood trees like we used to have. Um, and the reality is neither of those are super happy with the lack of groundwater anyway. Um, what we see on other parts of the Santa Cruz in Marana um, is that as soon as you get a flood and the river moves five or six feet over, then the cottonwoods that had been growing along the river start dying immediately because there's no groundwater for them to tap into. So they really need to have their roots like in the water. So for both flood control and ecological reasons, we won't get back to that historical cottonwood forest. In the riverbed, it seems like it. I mean, and I guess someone asked about the um, colonized wetland species being bulldozed, but I think you already answered that hopefully that won't happen for 
many years. Yeah, and if, you know, as it gets more developed, I think we would do the, the county was great about working with us and preserving small patches that would, you know, act as a, as a source, a seed source. Um, so I think if, if the community and the wetland community becomes way more rich and developed, you know, we'll adjust those preservation plans to make sure that, that we're capturing all those species um, before the next bulldozing thing. I plan, I plan to be here 30 years from now, so they'll have to deal with me then. <laughs> Well, this is, is a question um, that has come to my mind. Um, it seems like that it would be really beneficial to have some sort of an advisory group made up of scientists and um, knowledgeable people, historians, you know, to just look at kind of the overall picture and what the future plans are. Absolutely. Yeah, this, you know, and I think we've learned a lot from this project. As, as I've said a few times, it's an experiment and Tucson Water saw it that way um, and still does. Um, but I think we've learned a lot about how quickly the community gets interested in it, what some of the historical questions are and what some of the possibilities are. Um, this won't be the last time we're putting water into a dry stretch of the river. Um, there are other plans in the works. And so I'm, I'm thinking that we'll learn you know, a lot of the lessons we learned in this process and the communication and the guidance structure, I think we'll be able to apply that ahead of time um, for the next time around, which will be great. Uh, I see a question in the chat. It was, I think it was just a direct message, but it was asking about the older tamarisk trees that were in the channel. There were some older, large apple tamarisk. Um, some of those were removed purposefully during the, the sediment removal. A few were left in because um, they had a lot of bird nests in them when the, the um, sediment removal was done. Um, and so I think we'll have to like basically get the birds to switch into nesting on other things before we can remove those last few um, older and larger tamarisk trees. And then there's a question about dragonflies. Do you see that? see here. I saw it come through something about the larvae. Yeah, here we yeah. go. So how do these unpredicted dry downs affect dragonfly larval stages in the water? Yeah, that's a good question. What I'll put in a, a link here to, um, if I was given a whole dragonfly talk, I would have gotten into that. Um, <laughs> what we saw in the river last year during those dry down periods is the parts of the river that experienced drying, the dragonfly diversity took a nosedive. Uh, because those larvae that were in the water died when those parts dried up. And the parts closest to the outfall pipe, which were the wettest and held the water the longest, they had the most dragonfly species. Um, this year, since the sediment removal, the flow has been much more stable uh, because we figured out a lot of those bumps uh, from last year. And so now the same site that dried up and had low dragonfly diversity last year at Cushing Street has had high dragonfly diversity this year. So the, the loss of water certainly affects, you know, all the aquatic organisms. Um, but the good news is that they can bounce back fairly quickly. You know, that's what we've learned. Um, all the dragonflies had to disappear when the water was turned off for sediment removal. And almost all of them that came the first year have already come back in the river uh, the second year of the project. So they're, they're resilient, which is nice. So maybe I asked that question, so maybe I can just follow it up a little bit. So what's the normal time period between egg and emergence? I mean, how many, I presume the dragonflies around here have multiple reproductive, I mean, they reproduce continuously. So how long does the stream have to be continuously wet to get a dragonfly fly out of it? Yeah, it's it's really variable. And, and Gavin, our guest from, from uh, Jamaica, could definitely talk about this too, because that's part of what he studies. But there are some species that can go through their whole larval cycle in a couple weeks. I mean, they could just race through it and take advantage of just a short period of water. Um, but on average, I would say it takes six months or so up to a year. And so that's, that's why we need that more consistent water if we want to have higher biodiversity, because there's just a subset of them that can, can go through their cycle really fast. Some of them will actually prefer that. So some of the the saddlebags and the gliders, um, they like rivers that don't have any fish. 
and rivers that dry up because they don't have any competition in them. They think it's great and they can get through their life cycle really fast. Um, but in order to get the high biodiversity in the 40 some species we saw, you need, you need much more constant flow. And as you get further north, you can go up to, you know, up to Alaska and there are dragonflies there that take seven years to turn into adults um, from larvae. So it's, it all depends on temperature and the species. Oh my goodness. And then this is a, a more general question. Um, how dependent are the animals on the full plant community and are they able to get by fine with limited diversity? Yeah, I think again, that's yeah. gonna be a, a species specific answer, right? There's some that, that do just fine with three or four wetland plant species um, or, or riparian species. Um, and then there's others that are gonna need a specific type or a specific amount of that. Um, the, the cattails is a good example. So now that there's enough cattails and it's a large enough patch, there are things like red wing blackbirds uh, downtown. There are things like, there's a Virginia rail, which is not a common bird around here, um, that's living in the outfall marsh right now. But those are birds that need not only cattails, but they need tall cattails and they need a lot of cattails before they feel comfortable. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the more, in general, the more diversity of plants you can have and the diversity of sizes of those plants, you're gonna create more niches for, for different animals to come in. Um, and Lynn, you had put in the information about the book, um, An Agreeable Landscape. And, and so it does say here that members can get a 50% off coupon. Mm -hmm. So how, how can we save that information? Will you be? Um, I mean, I can, I can post it and some of the other connections that Michael's posted on a PDF on our website. Um, basically, you just go to the publisher and when you check out, you add the, put in this code Arizona 50 and then give you 50% off. So that's just it, okay. Um, well, that's easy to remember. And I'm just scrolling through here to make sure we didn't miss. Somebody asked uh, if people wish to donate to the ongoing efforts, where do we direct our money? That's always a nice question <laughs> to be asked. Oh, I missed that one. <laughs> Um, and so that that's a good question. You know, uh, I think if you're interested in directly supporting the research that we're doing, um, the university has a way of just accepting gifts. Um, and normally, like when I get a grant, they take a ridiculous amount of my grant money away for administration. Uh, like 50 percent of the money goes bye bye to the university. But gifts, uh, they only take a, a very small amount of money. Um, and then those it, go into an account that I could use to pay students to do work on the river, things like that. Um, so there's direct giving to the university. And then I would say, apart from that, you know, just donating to the, to the organizations that are, that are helping to do this work. So Sonoran Institute, Tucson Audubon, um, other nonprofits, you know, working with Angel, the, the guy who's, who's doing the work um, down at Cushing Street, you know, he takes small scale donations to buy trash bags. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that people could get involved at a lot of different levels. Is the watershed management group involved in this project at all? Not directly. They're involved a lot more um, at the broader scale, like thinking about the Santa Cruz River watershed in general, you know, including Tanca Verde and the Rito and everything. Um, and so they they've, they do a lot of really great work coordinating those larger scale thoughts. Um, but they're, I think they're on the ground specifically in the heritage project is, is not quite as heavy as they are in some other places. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's see. If the water district's interest is in recharging the river, yet it does not seem to affect the groundwater, where is the recharge taking place? Um, so the thing that Tucson Water learned is actually the groundwater recharge in this particular area happens really fast. So when they first started releasing effluent, in June 2019, the groundwater was about 120 feet below the surface. And within five months, it came up to only about 58 feet below the surface. So it rose 60 feet um, in a short amount of time. Um, so it, a lot of that water did seep into the groundwater really quickly. Um, and the, the issue became it was seeping in too well <laughs> and, and starting to threaten those landfills. Um, so they, they 
it seems like it's working really well. The problem is, is they can't put enough in because of those landfills. And so that's why the, the city is already thinking about, okay, where are other places in the river that we could put in water to help recharge different parts of the aquifer? Let's see, Gay says, what, is, uh, what are the big trees that have grown up in the upper part of the Santa Cruz near Cortara Road? Um, it's a mix there. A lot of them are um, apple tamarisk, uh, really large tamarisk trees, but um, because that part of the river has been flowing for almost 50 years now, um, there are a few cottonwoods in there um, and there are a, a good number of mature willow trees in there. Um, the cottonwoods have the same issue that I talked about before where after a flood and the river moves, then, then the cottonwoods pretty much die off. Um, the willows are a little bit tougher without groundwater. And so they tend to grow a little bit longer and survive better than the, than the cottonwoods. But that's, that's a nice place to go. If you go to um, Cortero Road or uh, Sunset Road or, or Camino del Cerro, you can walk through the river there and, and kind of get a sense of at least a, a tiny glimpse of what the river used to be like. Um, the flood control channel is much wider there. And so the flood control district can allow trees to grow without worrying about flooding the neighborhood. Downtown is, is probably the worst spot to put in water um, from a flood control perspective, even if it's the best spot from a you know, city perspective. Uh, have there been discussions about future wastewater discharge locations in the Santa Cruz? Yep, definitely. Um, I think Tucson Water will, will make announcements when they're ready to publicly discuss <laughs> where other discharge points might be because they, they depends on funding and infrastructure and where they can get pipes to and then permitting. Um, it is a, it's a wildly complex project um, to put water in the river. The, the, the city technically owns the water, but the riverbed itself is owned by Pima County Flood Control District. But the groundwater is managed by the state and the Arizona Department of Water Resources. So all those three have to agree and come together and and get permits and make a plan before any discharge into the river can happen. Wow. Oh yeah, and Lynn just put a great um, thing in the chat. There's a, a new webinar coming up, What's Our Water Future? That's on March 20th. That's a good one to, to promote. Uh, tell us about the invasive, invasive species polar. When is he there on Sunday? Uh, 9 a.m. to noon. Sunday directly underneath the Cushing Bridge. So if you go and park near the Mercado Annex or near the, the um, you know, I, I still call it the new Cushing Bridge, but I guess it's like 10 years old or more now. <laughs> uh, but if you park there and just go right on the loop, you can get into the river channel really easily. And that's, you'll see people with, with bags and, and gloves and it's a, it's a great group to get involved with. I, I just stumbled across them when I was setting up a wildlife camera there and and we, we, were, we became quick friends. <laughs> so I had a question, uh, Michael. I was wondering, I know that the river is also running above ground a lot of time down near the San Javier district. And I know you haven't been able to be there when it started to fill. So you don't really have the starting at day zero that you have for the Tucson Midtown. But have you done any sampling down there and compared what you're seeing, what they're seeing down there at, to what we might expect we're going to see in Tucson over the longer term? Does that give you some insights into where we might be headed? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I, I've, I've been in touch with and, and had some meetings with folks from Santa Vera and from the the natural resources department of course you know it's a sovereign nation so they just don't they don't want anyone to just come on and, and do studies on their land um, so what i've been doing is basically just offering to to provide any guidance or any information or any you know if, if they want any information or help i'm happy to to help them with it um, i did get to do a site visit there it is different um, from what's happening anywhere else on the Santa Cruz because of the groundwater issue. Um, so what, what is happening on Santa Vera is they're getting water, um, the Tanatham Nation is getting water from the state um, as part of water that they're owed because we, you know, we had wells all around the Santa Vera district and we basically took too much of their water 
in the past. Um, so there's a water settlement act. They're getting water from the state. They're using that water specifically to recharge groundwater next to the river. And so what they've actually been able to accomplish there is not surface flow from that groundwater recharge, but the actual groundwater itself rising up to the river bottom and coming into the riverbed like it would in a natural ecosystem. So what, what I, they're starting to see there is, is you know, pretty close to what I would call true restoration. Um, so if you're driving along on I-19, especially if you're heading north and you look to your, to your right on the east, you will see a big strip of juvenile cottonwood trees that are growing along the channel because they have the groundwater, they're getting the, the things that they need to be happy. Um, so I think it's, it's really exciting what, what the, the Tanoff Nation and, and Santa Rio District in particular is, is doing there. Um, so I, I, I hope they um, are able to share that in, in the future as they feel is appropriate because there's, there's certainly a lot of good lessons to learn. We won't get that way in, in downtown Tucson ever, unfortunately, um, but it could provide some clue as to what, what, we, what we might be able to do in a place like Tanka Verde if we did a lot more recharge um, out on the east side of town and got Tanka Verde to flow year round or the very highest part of the Rito to flow year round, then I think what they're seeing on Santa Vera would be a, a perfect parallel to that. There's a question here about where the water's coming from this thing just charged in the sun have here. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, basically where our water comes from as well, which is the, the uh, Colorado River. Central Arizona. Canada. Central Arizona project, yep, makes deliveries to Tucson. We use it to charge groundwater out in Aver Valley, and then we draw that groundwater back up um, and use it for our municipal supply. And so part of that, um, that Central Arizona project water from the Colorado River goes directly to, to Santa Beer, um, and they're using it for flood farm irrigation next to the river. Um, and then they have some, some actual like channels where they are purposely recharging water um, but the water that's in the river itself is, is that water, but that has already passed through the ground and come up and expressed itself as groundwater at the surface. So it's, it's a natural system. Excellent. And the Desert Laboratory, I think last fall, had a series of lectures on the Santa Cruz and they included a, a lecture by some of the folks from San Javier talking about that project. So if you go to the Desert Laboratory, website, you can find links to those videos that are available online. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really <clears throat> inspirational what they're doing there. So are we wrapped up for now? I think we'll call it quits. It's a little after eight, but thank you so much, Michael. I thought it was really, really interesting just for us Tucson residents to get a historical perspective on what's what the river used to look like and and you know to just have a deep dive into thinking about what our place looked like over the last hundred years and and it's really really great to have your perspective on that. yeah thanks for having me it was a pleasure yeah, and, and i have to say i think it's exciting that your um colleague from jamaica joined us too <clears throat> i think this is our first international um visit so that's very cool. That's the, the wonder of, of social media. <laughs> yeah, in a, in, in a good way. Yes, exactly. So thanks for joining us, Gavin. So <laughs> on your thanks, video, Mike. or you can use the clap icon under react. Thanks, Ken. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, I can't you, find that. Well, I'll just do this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for joining us and um, we'll be back next month. And you can watch our website um, and you'll get an email blast. Our speaker next week, next month is on April 8th and her name is Dara Saville and she's gonna talk about um, the ecology of herbal medicine or understanding the medicinal properties of plants. Yes, and she's, um, actually from New Mexico. So this is also our first, um, I think our first out of town speaker. So thank you. Have a great month, everyone. And 
Pay attention to what's happening in the world around you. Good night. Bye.